grateful to have this chance to meet with you and uh, speak with you this afternoon about how we work with wounded families, wounded family systems, the sacredness of that work, and uh, the countertransference challenges that are posed by working with crazy families. And I use the term lovingly, <laughs> respectfully, and with lots of identification, the word crazy. Um, I haven't run into a lot of families that aren't crazy in one way or another. And I certainly grew up in a family that has many of the characteristics of the kind of wounded family system that we're going to be talking about today. It's also my hope that you'll leave this workshop a little bit more in touch with how you make this work tolerable and meaningful for you. Like, I'm really into an examination of the ground of being from which we do this work and how I sit in the work so that I can keep coming back. It's kind of like quitting drinking, you know, if, you know, alcoholics come in three flavors, drinking and using, dried out and abstinent, recovering. And that middle group is a good one to avoid. You know, you've all heard the expression, I liked him better when he was drinking, you know? So if I do, the, what I'm getting at with that is, if all I'm doing is just like tolerating this work and finding a way to get through the day and then go home, I'm going to be restless, irritable, and discontented, I think, on many levels, and a lot less spiritually available to my clients, and a lot more miserable deeper down inside. So I don't feel like I'm here to tell you how you should make the work meaningful. But I'm here to present and talk a little bit about a way of thinking about that and a way of moving toward that that I hope you would find useful. In addition, I'd like to present to you a model that I've developed along with some of my mentors, certainly, of wounded family systems, including some of the characteristics of the kind of family systems that we will run into, the hallmark feature being they produce individuals who have severe compulsion, mental illness, and or addiction. Or whether they produce them or not is actually a figure of speech. I don't believe they're produced there. But certainly, I haven't met many people who've needed acute care who haven't come from a family system that has many of these characteristics. And I use that language very intentionally. It has many of these characteristics. In other words, I'm not calling it this thing saying that these family systems share these characteristics that we're going to talk about. And to the degree to which I pay attention to the sustainable posture that I'm trying to develop in doing the work, I am a mindful healer, my definition. To the extent that I attend to how I'm attending, I'm a mindful healer. So that's a title I originally came up with because I was presenting at Freud Meets Buddha for Ben Franklin, and it was all, I had to get mindful in there. <laughs> Hope I'm not oversharing, but that is how that came about. But uh, it's now become very meaningful to me to consider. You know, can I think about how I think? But more importantly, I was at a uh, Zen monastery in uh, Tassajara, California. Now, it makes it sound like I spent a lot of time in Zen monasteries, right? <laughs> The 30 hours I spent there include 99% of the hours I've spent in Zen monasteries in my entire life. Uh, but we're at a uh, talk from the abbot. She's the abbot of San Francisco Zen Center. And her Dharma talk that night was about creating a sustainable posture. Now, ostensibly, she was talking about, at the manifest level, how one you know, can sit Zazen 30, 40, 60 minutes or more. Most of the um, devotees, trainees there were sitting about an hour a day, an hour at a stretch, two or three times a day. But I, I couldn't help but hear her also talking about how does one sit in the world? And that got me thinking, how do I sit in my practice, in my work with my clients? And might I want to put some energy into creating a sustainable posture? And by sustainable, I mean I can do it again tomorrow without suffering more losses. Like, I could do it tomorrow, I could do it the day after that, I could do it the day after that without it costing me. And I talk to the families a lot about sustainable ways of interacting 
if we treat each other tomorrow the way we treated each other today, what kind of path are we on? You know, toward closeness, toward just getting by, or toward more losses, destructiveness, violence, pain, disease. We've got lots of words for that. So that's what our talk's going to be about. I do have a little activity that I'd like to do with you that might bring you a little closer to your own definition of this or to deepening your definition of finding a sustainable posture. Seeking a grounded stance is another phrase I like to use for it. I think you'll hear when I talk, I, I, I use a lot of synonyms and I'm not trying to give you the feeling like I think you don't understand the first word. I say it lots of different ways because people connect differently. And I find that in working with families, that's really helpful, is to, you know, hit it five ways. And then the kid, you know, the 12 year old say, oh, oh, okay, so that's what you mean, nonverbal communication. Like when my dad gives me the finger, okay, yeah, oh, sure, we have lots of nonverbal communication. Now I get it. <laughs> I'm not going to tell. I brought a family member, which is always challenging. So. Let's just wonder together, pause, you know, and I would ask you, what is your ground of being? And when a, a very sensitive healer asked me at a time of great crisis in my life what mine was, I said, I feel like I just kind of get blown along in the wind on the tide of whatever. Can you have a wind and a tide? It's a mixed metaphor. I just get kind of carried along on whatever's up. And that came for me to really define something I knew I needed to change or really examine. And that's what I want to talk about today in addition to talking about family systems. So starting with ways of thinking about and talking together about my, and I'm speaking for you in the first person if I can, dare, my grounded stance, my sustainable posture, my viable position, you know, my um, centered place that you would bring into your office or your clinic or your lecture hall or your kitchen. <laughs> One of the most challenging places to maintain this. And um, a contemplative healer that I admire very much, his name is uh, Dr. James Finley. He's a disciple of uh, Thomas Merton in the uh, Christian tradition like most of us Jew boys from Queens were raised in. <laughs> Talks about the primary wound and for you people who work in trauma and related, and frankly, we all do, right? We all work in trauma and related. But the more we get toward a definition of trauma, um, I think what we're talking about is an interruption in the sense of safety. You know, that's what I talk to my clients about. You know, what is trauma? Do I have trauma? You know, trauma for me is an interruption in the sense of safety, especially destructive when it's at the hand of or in the presence of those upon whom the, in, the person relied for safety. And so we have lots of gradations of it, you know, when that person who ought to be providing your safety is actively assaulting and harming you, that'd be a pretty radical level of trauma, right? But if that person's sort of down the hall, then there's a more passive level, and on and on, all the way down to an interruption in the sense of safety that you just wish the people who were responsible for your safety could have prevented. Well, Finley says that we all carry a primary wound, which, in my words, is a disconnection from fundamental goodness. And in the, if you're an AA book person or a 12-step person, it says, page 53, I think, or 55, inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of good. Now, does anyone want to correct me? I misquoted it slightly. It actually says, is the fundamental idea of God. But I like to quote it substituting the word good, though the word God is fine. It's actually a, a good word. <laughs> but more importantly is what we're talking about, and we, I see this in my clients, whether they're the person who needs acute care or just came back from it, their wife, their mother, their kid, is a fundamental disconnection from their own sense of goodness, of self. So if we're sitting with people who are disconnected from and we have our own experiences of disconnection from goodness, might we want to pay some attention to that? That's all I, this is all very soft. You know, it's about opening one's consciousness and wondering. You know, I'll do a three-day workshop with five or six families, and I'll tell them, all I want you to do is leave here wondering. 
wondering, could I be participating in some kind of covert deal with my kid that's contributing to the cycles of illness and loss and relapse that we're experiencing? Could you just wonder that? You know, could I be caught in some kind of unspoken arrangement that actually has the exact opposite effect of what I say I want, which is just for you know, Brenda to be fine and come home and have a sober, wonderful life? I just want you, mom, dad, sister, to wonder that. Could some of what our person in treatment be uh, going through be an expression or an embodiment of distress that has its origins in our family system? Again, wondering. Because the minute you turn your attention, this is mindfulness in its purest form, turn your attention to other possibilities, shifts occur. Psych that's, the, that's the definition of psychodrama, if I could dare put one forth, you know, on my own, and I'm daring, you know, is to alter the way that we're perceiving and understanding long set patterns of interacting, responding, incorporating, identifying, holding at bay, rejecting, and everything in between. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. And I have this primary wound, and it can get activated a disconnection from the fundamental experience of my own goodness. And there's lots of things that one could call it. I'm going to suspect that most of us are at risk of having moments like that, or more, or more. So many of us carry, and our clients certainly carry, what I call covert messages of disconnection. Things that we say to ourselves, I'll look in the mirror and say it to myself, I probably did it today. I know I did it today. <laughs> that, you know, say, you know, you're blowing this, you're wrong, you're a ruiner. You know, we got messages that told us we were in the way, that told us our needs were a problem, that told us that we take too much. And helping our clients start to understand some of the stories they tell themselves or the messages they carry that promote disconnection from fun contact with fundamental goodness contact with God if you like. You'll have clients who will like that. You'll have clients who get, will threaten to sue you for saying that. I mean, if you, know, if you go all the way over to the other side. But people don't really seem to have a problem with the idea of good. You know, the idea of belonging, the idea of being cared for, the idea of deserving love. They don't really... God may be more of a problem on average, but, you know, deserving love, belonging, you know, entitled to exist? Yeah, okay. That's what I'm talking about, about goodness. So here's what we can do for ourselves. Contemplate our own sources of connection. You know, to what do I connect and identify? We're going to play with this a little bit more. Integrate sacred, a word I really like and perhaps overuse, but I try to use it, I'm using it very broadly. You know, integrate sacred practices into our own care regimens and how we pay attention. Already he's talked about developing a sustainable posture. And then one of my favorite ideas that I have to apply to myself is to often remind myself, what do I ask my clients to do? And if they're in treatment, in a treatment center, we're asking them to do it 6, 8, 10, 12 hours a day sometimes. Show up, tell the truth, and ask for help. So I have to ask myself, as part of this, how am I doing that? You know, how am I showing up? And these are all, I hope you will use all these ideas very broadly, what it means to show up, tell the truth, and ask for help. Okay. Any comments or questions so far? In my experience, there are these, there's a sixth one I'm going to add today. What gets in our way? You know, so I have a sustainable posture, I believe I'm developing one, I have a ground of being, I show up for work, I'm ready to go, I can tolerate, I can experience, I can connect, I can resonate, you know, I'm a counter-transference Stradivarius. Play me. It's going to sound good, right? Here's what interrupts that. <laughs> Usually in about the same number of seconds it took me to tell you about that, I'm interrupted. And there, there are these features, you know, I can read them to you. They're the things that get out of order, the things that are out of phase, the things that are chaotic and unpredictable, the ways in which we get distracted. You know, my mind is a super distractor. The ways in which I disconnect just from my own fundamental goodness and disconnect from relationship with you. I get worried, I get threatened, I get overwhelmed, I get nervous, I, don't, I worry about how I'm looking good and I'm gone. I've got to come back. You know, Father Martin says in that video, when you step off the base 
of recovery come back. I remember watching that in treatment myself, like 45 days ago. Look at me. This is a tough room. I think went nowhere. <laughs> 46 days. Come on. <laughs> Deprivation and dissonance. I want to add doubt because I'm discovering more and more that the ways we manage uncertainty, how do I manage uncertainty, are very powerful and very complex. And to the extent that I can sit with my clients and kind of say, you know, my job actually is to be with you in the presence of great uncertainty. Change. Change without knowing what the change is going to be is a big job. Like I grew up in a family where you, didn't, you weren't supposed to know the answer. You were supposed to know the question. Right? It was like jeopardy. You bet you're, you're supposed to not even, because you know, the, the best thing you could do was answer sooner, before the question's even out, answer. You know, and I would get report cards that would, where that would be written. You know, Kenneth seems to need to try to give the answer even before I finish asking the question. The message I got was, you, better, you should know the question before it's even asked. Right? And that's a, that's, an, a strat that's a strategy to try to eliminate or resolve uncertainty. This is so important, I feel, at least in my current work. And so I say to my clients a lot, my job is to sit with you and for us to be together in the presence of great uncertainty. Because parents especially, how many people work with parents of children or young adults where the child or the young adult is the one you know, struggling and needing help. Okay, a smattering. I give parents a little three-step dealio, not, a, not jargon, dealio, to help them um, pursue change. In the first step, they're empowered to say, this thing we're in with each other, you and me, kid, whatever, it's not okay with me. That's it. Just to say, this isn't okay with me, the way this is all going. Step two is to say, you know what? I'm not going to keep participating in our deal, our relationship, our family, very intentional language here, in exactly the same way that I have been. Because I always want to empower family members to never put themselves in a box by saying, one more time and ah, that's it, boom. We really try to, I want them to have all the chips. I want them to say, yeah, I don't see that working out too good. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to hang with that. Or I think I've already let you know that this interaction here right now, like the kind we're having, this is what doesn't work for me. So step one, this, this isn't working for me. Step two, I'm not going to keep participating in exactly the same way. Now the reason this is so difficult is if you grew up in a household like I did, if I'm going to say as the dad, you know what, I can't, I'm not going to participate in this deal the same way anymore, then there's a voice in my head, and it may well come out of my kid as well, oh yeah, well what are you going to do? Kick me out, change the locks, move to Switzerland? In other words, I believe at a level that interrupts my capacity to sit with uncertainty, right? I believe if I'm going to say, hmm, not sure what I'm going to do, but not going to do this anymore, I have to be ready with like the 14-step plan of what we're going to do instead. And a big part of my work is helping people just say, all I know for right now is I'm not going to keep participating in exactly the same way I have been, with little or no formal idea of what they're going to do instead, and to make that okay. And that's my job is to help them sit with it. And then just for your information, step three is build a network of allies that will walk with you through no longer participating in the same way. And that's where most people quit. You know, the easiest place to build a network of allies, allies would be Al-Anon, if it's, if it's related to addiction and so on. It'd be the easiest place. Most people think, you know, just the husband and the wife, they'll figure it out. They can do, we can, you know, we don't do our laundry out in the street, right? You've all heard various metaphors on that. But I'm positive that none of us can do this alone. And probably your main life partner in and of themselves is inadequate. That the stuff between you, that's mired between you, and the way in which the other family members are triangulated, incorporated, you know, the roles that they play in the, in the psychological dance that is the marriage, are, are, are interfere too much with being able to figure out ourselves. You know, one of my mentors, Sharon Wegscheider Cruz, I'm sure you've heard of her, a wonderful woman, she describes couples work as going like this. And what that represents is, Stephanie Brown is into this too, that in the course of an hour, a day, a month, a year, it doesn't matter. We each, this is us, you know, mom and dad, we each go out and do our own work, 
you know, on our own, and then we come back together, and we kind of review and work together, and then we go out, and the whole thing looks like that. And when I make that motion for people, they usually don't like it very much because they don't want to do this part. They want to just, you know, dinner in a meeting kind of thing, which is not bad, but it doesn't work in and of itself. So we've got to be cautious to not, to help protect our clients from the idea that they have to have all the answers. Let's sit together in uncertainty. Well, that means I have to be able to sit in uncertainty first. And that comes back to the ground of being. You know, how about I don't know? How about we don't have to know? How about what do we know? What do we know? Can that be enough? I know that this deal makes me sick. You know, I score a lot of points with family members, although it startles them, and their client and treatment doesn't like it that much, when they'll say, you know, my son says he wants to come home and get his old room back, and God, I don't know, you know, I just think he's going to this and he's going to that. And, well, are you ready to have him home? Oh, God, no. Well, why can't that be salient? Well, but his therapist says he's probably pretty much ready to go. And we have an outpatient program lined up for him. And, uh, but I've heard you say you're not ready. I'm definitely not ready. I can't bear the thought of it. Well, what if we went with that? Well, what do you mean I would just not let up? Well, what if you just sat with that and said that? You know, I, I understand you're ready and so on, but you know what? I'm not sure what to do with this, but I'm not. Like, what if that's just true? A phrase I use a lot. What if that's just true? And to, if you work with family members, co-addicts and so on, you know they have no belief that that could possibly be something that would turn into, could even be said, it seems too terrible to face. And that's our work too. It's not too terrible to face. It sounds like it's really true. Because they'll say, oh God, no way. Now if the kid's sitting there or the husband or whoever, you know, that seems like blasphemy. Doubt, big one. Okay, so I already talked a little bit about this. I jumped ahead. How do we bring the family into a conversation like this? What are the themes that translate into family systems? And as I said, and I'll say this in the first 20 minutes often of a family workshop, a day workshop, a week, whatever, a week workshop. If it's a 50 minute, I don't do 50 minute hours, I do 75 minute hours in the office with families. I just can't do the 50 minute with a family. It's just, and I charge them 150% of the fee because it's 150% of the time. And I don't get a lot of pushback on that. If they need a discount, we do the same discount. We would, you know what I'm saying? It, but soon I'll be talking about what, what I already mentioned, you know, to start to be, wonder. I know you came here to support Jessica or Johnny or Jennifer or Jimmy or Jeremiah, somebody with the letter J. And, but what I want to tell you is thank you for that. They need you. Let's start to open our minds to some of these other things that I already mentioned. Might you be participating in ways that contribute to these cycles of illness and loss? Now, a person could hear that as, we, all, we both know this is really all your fault, right? But if you don't believe that in your heart, I don't believe that. I don't believe blame is of any use. And you use language like this. It gets neutralized. And you say, I imagine you're kind of worried that you're going to be blamed. But what if instead we look at how you're participating? What do you do? So for example, you have the belief, you know you're not ready to resume living together with this person on day 29. What do you do with that? You know, no, this person would say, oh, I, I squash it, I get rid of it. But what they really do is they turn their attention to the inner world of that other person. Well, she promises that she's going to do this, and I know she gets really upset, and if I were to say that she could, and then she, then she, I mean, this happens every workshop I do. Tell me a little bit about some of the feelings that you've experienced as you've gone on this ride with Jessica. Well, she, <laughs> and often I'll say to people, you know, you can't answer the question, how was that for you, using the pronoun he or she. <laughs> You're going to have to go with I or me or we or us. But it's startling. And I, I, I often have a co-facilitator. Sometimes it's somebody in, in training. And I'll tell them about this. And after they start to get it, they'll be like, wow, that's unbelievable, man. <laughs> you asked her such an easy question about herself. And she told you more about her son. Do you see how that's a psychological strategy to manage uncertainty? Do you see how that could be an expression of disconnection from one's own sense of self? My head is filled with you, with her. I was telling my 13-year-old at the time what codependency was as I understood it. And he said to me, kind of like asking someone else if they want to play solitaire, huh? 
And I was like, yes, it's exactly like that. How this condition might be an expression of family system distress. And then, you know, I said, let's together launch an effort to interrupt these patterns and therefore interrupt the transmission to the next generation of these impaired coping strategies. Okay. And that led me to call this condition that I haven't found many families an exception from who have a person who's come to acute care. Stress-induced impaired coping, also known as family addictive disease, also known as family system pathology. I call it stress-induced impaired coping. I haven't spent the $700 to trademark it. I probably should. I probably shouldn't tell you guys that in case somebody's iPadding their way to the book. Here's what it looks like. It's based on the disease model. It is. In which to have a disease, one must have a susceptible host, that's the house, a toxin, and an environment in which they can dance together. Okay, so to get alcoholism, you need alcohol. You need a brain that can become alcoholic. Some brains more easily than others, although we can addict any brain, but some predisposed as a result of genetics or early stress experiences. And you need an environment where the brain can meet alcohol on multiple occasions to develop addiction, right? How about there are families that are susceptible to developing this condition as a result of losses and secrets and tragedies, ways in which the family system has been rocked, perhaps going back a couple of generations, such that they have greater susceptibility to developing this condition. I believe that. It requires the idea, though, that a family could have a core. A family could have a core or a soul or an unconscious. Could you allow that possibility? Or a heart, Some, anything. You know, like a person does. I don't think any of us would really need to dispute that to death, but you could allow that. But could a family system have a core or a soul or a spirit or a heart or an unconscious, any, whichever one you like? And anybody have another word for it you like? Okay. And if so, couldn't that thing be fractured or wounded or cracked or vulnerable? or beat up, any word you like. In this model, that's what's true. And as a result, the family members develop stress-induced impaired coping. The way you spot it is by its environmental characteristics. And guess what? They're the same, they're the same energies that interrupt our grounded stance. Disorder, distraction, disconnection, deprivation, denial, and doubt. So you're getting this hot off the press. Doubt is and you're going to make the slides when I cut the slide. And doubt. In the wounded family system, disorder takes the form of out-of-phase development. Parentified children. We have an expert in the room on the inner child. Parentified children. Kids who are pulled into a parental role with no conversation, no discussion. Why? How is it you started changing your brother's diapers when you were five? What do you think she says? You guys, have, have you ever asked? Have you ever asked a 12-year-old girl who's, been, who's changed three sets of kids' diapers, her siblings, why, how she came to do that? Do you know what she says? They all say the same thing. He was crying. He was wet and he was crying. That's, that's, how, she, that's how she decided to do it. So you see, that there was a, it was a vacuum into which she stepped. It made total sense to her. Hunter will go, go along with this when we ask people to choose a position in a, drama, in a dramatization, or play a role, or live out an energy. We ask them, just pick one. We ask them afterwards, how did you choose that one? I could write down what he'll say. It just seemed, I don't know, just seemed right. It just came to me, something like that, right? That's the same way we end up in these conditions. It's just kind of automatic. The disconnection has already been mentioned, but in wounded family systems, the disconnections we see are you know, broken pairs, feuds, and battles. But more importantly, people who grew up in these systems come to us disconnected from themselves. Like the mom who can't tell you about her emotional ride with her daughter. She can tell you about her daughter, and her daughter's mind, and her daughter's boyfriend, and her daughter's future, and her daughter's life, and her daughter's fantasies, and her daughter's diary, and her blah, 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 blah. That's a disconnection from self. The system itself is often disconnected and distracted from the fundamental tasks of being a family. Life often becomes much more about surviving, 
than about generating. Deprivation is a monster. I get to ask probably hundreds of young, younger people, what do you wish there had, and now I get ask parents now too, what do you wish there had been more of growing up? So let's say I have five families in a workshop, and the person in treatment isn't present at this point usually, and I'll split them up into either moms, dads, and siblings. So that's the most common. Spouses, spouses, siblings, moms, dads, and they'll do a little inventory exercise. And one of the questions will be, what do you wish there had been more of growing up? Now keep in mind, these are moms, dads, siblings, and spouses. Not necessarily people with primary Axis I diagnoses. The list is always the same. It's a list of spiritual and developmental nutrients. I wish it had been more affection, attention, fairness, balance, privacy, love shown between my parents for one another, I wish I'd had to earn more of what was just handed to me. I wish it had been more structure, more rules. You'd be surprised, right? You think people, they say structure. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I wish I'd been valued more for just what I was good at than what I was supposed to be. I wish it had been more of a match between how life was inside the house and how we were supposed to look to the outside world. It's the same list over and over and over. That's what I mean by deprivation. If you say, what do you believe you were deprived of growing up? Ah, oh, we, we had a great family now. It was, it was all, you know, but if instead, what do you wish there had been more of? This is the list that gets produced. I'm sure I've inventoried really hundreds of people. One guy wrote steak. One guy wrote fishing. At Serenity Knowles, in fact, West Marin. But in that same meeting, and I think that guy was having me off, I do. In that same meeting where a guy wrote steak and fishing, another kid wrote five days sober heroin addict. I wish I'd had to earn more of what was freely given to me. And I, I didn't cry, but I was so moved when I read that. I told that kid, this is going to help hundreds of people. Because I'm going to tell everybody when I have the mo right moment that you wrote this. I wish I'd had to earn more of what was just freely given to me. Five days sober, 20 years old. That's what I mean by deprivation in a wounded family system. And he knew it. And then the, the sixth one is doubt. How uncertainty, I have to use a D, right? How uncertainty gets managed and railroaded and, and eliminated is a hallmark feature of the wounded family system. So what's the, what's the impaired part, Kenneth? What's, all right. Bottles and James wine coolers now come in a, no, 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 sorry. If you live in such a system, you are going to find a way to make it tolerable. You are going to find a way to cope. We're great adapters, human beings. Look, we can live in 114 degrees for 97 seconds until we run into an air conditioner. <laughs> but we are great adapters. And I'm going to propose to you that a person can do one of four things. There may be a fifth, but it doesn't matter. You tell me what you think. You can escape. How might you escape? There you are growing up in a wounded family system with high levels of disorder, distraction, disconnection, deprivation, denial, despair, and doubt. How do you think you might escape? Think simple. Drink or use. Sorry? Sure, yes. Go into your mind. Chemicals, computers. What's another really common way? What if we want? Yes, you got all of them, all the processed stuff. Yes, there's one more. What if you want to escape this room right now? What would you do? Leave. There's lots of leaving goes on in these systems. So it's numbing out through all the methods you guys mentioned chemical, behavioral, fantastical, and then there's leaving. Yes. Another thing you could do, and remember these, this is a model, so it's, it's pure in a theoretical sense, it's impure as applied. People will do combinations and there's hybrids, right? But another common posture one could take in such a system is try to fix it, or more commonly, fix somebody, like have a project person. This, of course, would be the classic alcoholic dad, let's say, and codependent wife, mom who covers for him and, you know, puts up with it all and, and all that. Well, that would be one version of fixing. Fixing comes in a couple of flavors. There are people who fix through control, you know, like trying to run it, tell us how it should be. And there are people who try to fix through infinite giving, the martyrs. If you're Jewish or Italian, and Filipinos fit this too, and many Latinos as well, there's a lot of cooking goes on by fixers. And, you know, the managot or the chicken soup, or the uh, mancha manteles, we'll fix it. You know, just eat. 
Look how hard I worked on this meal. Now you drank a bottle of wine and you're going to go drive? Come on. Look, look, how, look at this. Why would you have to even leave? And so fixers take that martyr form as well. Another thing you could do is you could distract. Um, most common, oh, there's another fixer, which is the broker. The, the broker fixer. This is the person who knows what everybody needs knows all the feuds and problems and tough spots and it's going to smooth everything out. Listen, we can go to Aunt Teresa's after all because Aunt Maria is really excited to see little Patrizia who's going to be there from Italy and therefore we'll have her upstairs and then uh, uh, infinite brokering. But can you see how that would solve, how that would be adaptive? How if I'm infinitely brokering, right, my mind is filled with what? All these, you know, all these um, strategies to manage all the disconnection and all the work, right? I'm, I'm resolved. I don't have to, I don't face the pain of living in a wounded family system. I don't sit in the truth that, like, I might be participating in a way that contributes to the cycles of illness, loss, and relapse, right? I don't wonder that, you know, maybe some of what's going on with Aunt Maria is an expression of distress that has its origins in our family system, perhaps going back several generations. I'm busy. I'm filled up. Who does that sound like? Here's a hint. It sounds like the addict, right? That was someone, you guys, what are you, where are you, what were you, you guys from, Ohio or something? It was really bad? Really? Okay. Whitfield got it. I did, I was, I was using the, I was using my teeth. <laughs> I want to meet her. Who is that? Corbett? Yeah, right on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. I didn't, she didn't do that. She had really good veins. All right. All right. So, sorry. I'm sorry. It's hot. I get, I get a little weird. I, I should have warned you. I should have warned you. Distractors are, are superstars in the family. You know, the, the girl that gets it all right or the guy that gets, you know, she's in the newspaper, she's a track star, she's dating the football captain, she's going to Brown on a full ride, but she's still writing her Princeton essay just in case. And she's insatiable. She makes sandwiches for the homeless on weekends, she started a Latin club, but it is, it, it's never enough. It's not, you know, and when I ask her, well, sweetie, just to help me understand, if you're just feeling like really insecure, you can't get it done, what do you do? And she just bursts into tears, spontaneously. I'll never forget this girl. And she says, I'm not allowed to feel that way. And you know where that rule comes from? I'm not allowed to feel that way? Inside her. Because her mother has been telling her, in many cases, for a couple of years, take it easy, have some fun, you're 17, relax, don't beat yourself up. They don't need a math club, they got an they algebra club, they got a trigonometry club, they got a calculus club, they don't need an arithmetic club. Just, you know, why don't you just enjoy your life? You know, it doesn't matter. What's the behavioral health care condition this girl will almost certainly experience, most likely? Thank you. Absolute disordered eating. Guaranteed, almost. So she has this infinite level of expectation. But remember, she's also able to distract herself through this behavior. So it helps her manage the intolerable experience of the wounded family system environment. Potentially intolerable. And it serves the system, like everybody else does, with a function that helps keep everything in motion. Homeostasis, in balance. All the roles serve the person to help them manage the experience and serve the system to keep it motoring along in its, in its way. The other distractor is the super provider. This is um, often in families with like their own business. It doesn't have to be, though. The super provider is a, a workaholic, a phrase I don't love, but just works and works and works. And basically, the super provider is able to say, hey, you know, you guys have this whole like emotional family, emotional life. Don't look to me for, well, Dad, you know, I've learned in treatment that if you'd maybe just been a little more emotionally available. Now, look, look, look. You wouldn't have that BMW to get the DUI in in the first place if it wasn't for me. So don't talk to me about freaking emotional availability. These guys are all from Queens and Staten Island. Don't talk to me about freaking emotional availability. Right? So the super provider gets to distance himself. I'm using gender stereotypes. Indulge me. It's not required that, you know, to distance himself from the emotional underbelly of family life and believes he's actually immune and it's not necessary. 
for him to participate at that level because he works so hard to make everything possible. You could see how that would be a, a wonderful distraction and protection. So another exercise we do in the, in the three-day workshop is we split family members up into these four roles. The last one is blame. And they'll, you know, we'll get a handful of distractors and a hand, uh, and they'll each do an inventory. And one of the questions is, if I don't change, I probably will blank. And the answers are all the same. As you look, just look down that column, it doesn't matter if the escapees wrote it, the fixers, the blamed ones, the lost children, the scapegoats, that's the one I didn't cover yet, but I just did, or the distractors, the list is the same. Lose more. Health, sanity, hope, freedom, money, relationships, intimacy, physical things, you know, material things, that's the word I want. Lose more. Often they'll say, die, die young, have a heart attack, burn out fall apart. Startling. We'll put, I'll put all that up on a big board. Everybody's inventory. You know, the questions were, what were the main emotions you experienced? And you look down the list, you can't even tell which one was which role. How did others respond to you? There are differences there, but it's powerful. What were the advantages to playing this role? You know, I get the blamed ones. They give great answers, like the scapegoat kids, the kids are always in trouble, or the lost invisible children. What do you think the advantage was to being a kid always in trouble? What do you think they say? Think simple. Absolutely, common. But they say one other thing that surprised me. They say there were no expectations of me in the end. And my favorite kid said, in the end, they didn't even ask me to take out the garbage because they figured I'd screw that up too. And he was completely expectation free, which to him seemed an advantage. In a way, it kind of can be. But don't forget the guy who five days sober then said, I wish I'd had to earn more of what was just handed to me. It's a Pyrrhic victory at best to win that expectation game and be the kid who's not expected to be able to even take out the garbage. You know, that's soul crushing. It is. <sighs> Got lost. So these are, the, these are the roles people take on. Escaping, fixing, distracting, blaming, to make the experience of the five, now six Ds, including doubt, tolerable. And the system just spins around and it's pretty rigidly bonded. And what are we spinning around? Well, this is, this is the nut of it, you guys. You tell me what you think. It seems to me that if at the core of this, where we started, has been the transmission of a sense of loss or woundedness, fracturedness, brokenness, numbness, whatever you want to call it, then there must be something at the core that seems too terrible for us to face. And that's the language I use. The system is spinning around something that seems too terrible to face. And my best word, word for it is shame. And this is a, a shame-based system that's organized around not knowing itself, making tolerable the experience of the five or six Ds, and most tragically, transmitting this to the next generation relentlessly. And that's why I do the work. It's because we can interrupt that transmission. And I say to all my family members, I want you to leave this workshop or my office today, whatever, saying, it stops with me. That's what I want them to say. That's the title of the book. It stops with me. I'm going to interrupt how I participate. I'm going to interrupt the degree to which I transmit these ways of coping and being. And then I tell them the most important thing about that, little tiny shifts create huge changes. Little, just to wonder. I know, sweetheart, what are you saying? You can't find your mascara, some girl stole your lighter, and what else? The girl was making herself throw up in the bathroom. Uh-huh. And what do you, you want me to come pick you up because you, you just can't stand, okay. All right. Um, that sounds like a lot. I hope you're using some of the tools they're giving you there to deal with your lost mascara, cigarette lighter, and a girl vomiting. Um, listen, your father and I are going to Pilates right now. I'm going to give you a call on Thursday, okay? I know. All right. That's a small shift. That's a monstrous shift psychologically. Behaviorally, it's a small shift. But you know what I love about that? Is if that mom had said, I'm going to call the director, I'm going to FedEx you a lighter, and I'm going to send your cousin Cindy from Los Altos to pick you up in two hours. Well, forget the last part. I'm going to call the director, I'm going to FedEx you a lighter, and 
have you changed houses where there's no one who vomits? Or if the mom had said the thing I recommended, you know, I'll give you a call on it. Do you know what's true about the girl when she gets off the phone? What do you think she's going to do when she gets off that call? This girl in treatment who just made this call. What do you think she's going to do next? I'll give you a hint. She's going to do the same thing next, regardless of how, what mom responded with on that continuum. Nobody wants to guess? She's just going to keep doing her day. She's just going to go on to the next thing. Because it's an evacuation. Now, to the extent that the mom will absorb the evacuation, you, you with me here? Then there's a psychological transmission of anxiety and of uncertainty that fills up the mom. If she's a fixer, this works very nicely because now she has a project. I mean, you're not going to believe this, but some girl threw up in Jessica's room. This is an eating disorders program. They're letting people throw up, and her lighter was stolen. And she has no mascara. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm making fun of any of these. I'm not making fun. What I'm trying to bring to life in a way that we can laugh about because we identify is how this lives in the mind. Because I can give you lots of like, words for that, but this is how it lives. Can you see the function? Yes, Shari. <laughs> yes! My oldest one is 49. I have a 49-year-old kid. And the mom said, how can I trust that you'll even give her the sheets if I deliver them? And I said, ma'am, if you can't trust us to bring the sheets to your daughter, how can you trust us with her soul and her future and her spirit? And I said, I said your kid, right? She said, well, you call her my kid, but she's 49 years old, I'll have you know. <laughs> I didn't know the I'm going to come down and make her bed myself. <laughs> and she did. This was at Morningside in Newport Beach. The mom lived in Newport Beach. No one tells her, no. The plane slowed down for her. <laughs> if you fly out of Orange County, you know what I'm talking about. How are we doing? 315, right? Good. OK, this is one of my favorite parts of what I've come across, and I love sharing this. If I live in such a system, and I'm unable to interrupt the way I participate. Yes? Clear. 315. Thanks. 38. Thanks. What makes it so difficult for people to interrupt how they participate? Well, one thing that makes it difficult is they're maintaining this homeostasis that protects them from considering these things that seem too terrible to face. They're managing a sense of defectiveness and undeservedness of love and care, also known as shame. But they're also held by stories that they tell themselves about what they believe to be true. I call them the lies that bind. And they're powerful. And they're not to be mocked. They're, need, they need, they're to be examined. The most powerful is a parent. Let's take these for parents. And the kid can be you know, 11 to 50, <laughs> seriously. And the parent believes I'm keeping her alive, often based on actual experiences of saving the kid's life. So this is not a game, it's not a joke. But here's the rub of it. When I asked the girl, 25 years old, hey Stephanie, when it comes to high-risk sexual behavior, overdosing, or committing suicide, can your mom stop you? What do you think the girl says? I can't hear you. Let's get a little Montel up in here. What? No. no, she does. She says no. I've never had an exception. I've never had a kid, 12 to 40, say anything other than no in a heartbeat, as fast as you can answer, way faster than all of y'all. No. But even if the mom's sitting right next to her, doesn't matter. Now, this is not empirical data. This is heuristical, but I have done this hundreds of times. No. Now, the three things I picked for Stephanie, I mean, I picked the things that apply to that kid as I understand them. You know, I picked suicide, overdosing, and high-risk sexual behavior. Clearly, that girl would be engaged in those things or have just been recently. Now, get this. When I ask the mom, when it comes to those three things, do you believe you can stop your daughter? What do you think the mom say? They seem to say maybe, on if you average it, 
The answer seems to be maybe. So what do we make of the fact that the mom, or the dad, it doesn't matter, I'm gender stereotyping, is kind of held by and ruled by this belief that she's keeping her daughter alive, and in eating disorders, this is so profound, so common, yet the girls can tell you in a heartbeat, without a flinching, even in her mother's presence, she can't keep. That's the proof for me that it's a lie. How can I set that parent free of that moment? How can they be set free, not me? And I think the only way out, the best way out that I've found so far is something like this. To empower the parent to say to themselves, if she died from suicide, high-risk sexual behavior, overdosing or starving herself, that would be a tragedy from which I would never fully recover. We need to just honor that. That would be a tragedy from which I would never fully recover. I believe that. I'm a parent. Sure. I, I don't know that there could be full recovery from this, such a tragedy. It would haunt you. It would, you know, I, I would hope I wouldn't have to give my own life up over it, but it would be a tragedy from which I would never fully recover. But then we say, but I can no longer organize my life around a false belief that I can prevent it and then how that parent would operationalize that is very personal. Like they can hire someone who might even be here at this conference who would tell them exactly what they should do. I tell them, let's look at the options. I don't know what you should do, but I know that everything we've said so far is true. Let's look at what could you do. And that's where we, we do a very organic process. quick story about the organic process and what family members should do. Girl at a very good treatment center in Marin County, AMAs after three weeks, goes back to the apartment paid for by her mother and father. Dad's a cancer surgeon. Mom is a healer. They pay for everything for her. They're on the phone with me. She left treatment against medical advice. She's back at the apartment. Mom's saying, we will not pay another dime for that apartment. We're cutting her off. Dad's saying, I'll never sleep. I can't render my daughter homeless. So what do we do? Now they can hire someone who says, she has to hit bottom, you've got to cut her off, you've got to take everything away, you've got to take away her phone, you've got to take away her car, you've got to take away her makeup, you've got to take away her... Mm -hmm. She'll hit bottom and then she'll get it. I'm, I'm driving this dad to his bottom. He needs to go to Stanford tomorrow and be with some five-year-old kid who has leukemia. I want him to sleep tonight, me personally. I want him to be able to sleep. I want him to be able to choose an option that he believes he could sleep. So now it becomes an issue in the couple. So mom's sitting there with her Al-Anon Pharaoh staff, like, we must kick her out. You know, and dad's like, I'll never sleep. So what does it mean to each of them that your partner says, I will never sleep? And so, make a long story short, they didn't kick her out, but they cut it way the heck back. And this girl's actually doing very well. She went back to treatment four months later. But see, it needed to be an organic process. Yes, Richard. Please. That, that really illustrates well the whole point of this talk, which is, of course, these concepts that, I, that I'm grateful for the chance to share with you, but how do we live in this world? We, therapists, we clinicians, how do we engage in this field and make it meaningful, sustainable, tolerable, but more than just tolerable, more than just like, God, I hope nobody threatens suicide in my practice, uh, you know. <sighs> After last week, I can't take another one. Now, you might feel that way, sure, but what's your solution for that? You know, mine was Vicodin in my pocket, vodka in my desk drawer. It was. And I don't think it was a very good, very, and I had keys to the psych unit. I could let you win it out of the psych unit. I wasn't, I'm not even a lefty. 
Okay, the next lie that binds is if only. And for those of you that work in treatment centers, this is a very powerful one. In this one, I keep behaving the way I behave in my family deal based on the idea that if only we find the right doctor, medication, volunteer job, treatment center, guru, haircut, sorry? The right weight, yes, the right body shape, thank you. I'll, I'll add that from now on. That's very good, yes. Then everything will be fine. The reason it's a lie is the evidence is in, there isn't gonna be one thing. This is a system deal, we're gonna have to all get involved. There isn't, you know, we're not gonna if only find the right medication or the right body size and the right weight. That's great, thank you for adding that very much. Okay, the next one I see a lot and it's powerful. This one, in the person who's unable to resist playing in over and over, they have a belief that they owe. And often reinforced or derived from a message from, the other, from that person, you owe me. And this is especially true when there's been measurable trauma. And the parent, let's say, knows this bad thing happened. Maybe they did it. Maybe they overlooked it. Maybe they were just too busy to notice. Maybe they were absent. They feel culpable. It doesn't matter on that continuum, by the way, whether they did it or just it's that they believe they're responsible. And I actually have a kid who will say to his parents, I hope not today, he's getting a little bit better, you owe me a life, you owe me a girlfriend, you owe me a face, side note, yep, has a little, he was in a bad accident, he's got an almost imperceptible scar, he has body dysmorphic disorder, he believes this scar precludes him from engaging in the world, and everything in between. Because you let that happen that day and all the other things that we all know about. And those parents went around for two years with me and him chasing a way to pay him back. And the only way out that we found that I believe in is to be able to look that kid in the eye as the parent and say, that did happen. I let that happen. I was there. I was wrong. It happened. You're right. It did. But I can't repay you. I can't organize my life around figuring out how to pay you back, how to make it right. Now here's the critical piece, which if you don't include, it's, it's a botch. Then the parent says, but I'm right here, right now, showing up for this relationship with you. So that happened. I think I've given you a message that I can fix it or pay you back. I can't, but I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm showing up for this relationship. And you could, can you feel that? I mean, that is curative in a way. Everybody's free. Now, the parent has to allow, in this example, the possibility that that won't do it for the kid. Can I let my kid hate me, resent me, blame me? I hope so, because I need to be free and set him free to have that. So you see, what we're not changing somebody else. We're not, oh, okay, Dad. I mean, it makes a big difference when you look somebody in the eye and say, that happened, I let that happen, and I was wrong. That does make a powerful difference. If not in the moment, certainly over time. But when you then say, and I'm showing up for this relationship in a full way, you hit pay dirt. But can you see how if you're the product of a wounded family system, showing up for a relationship in a full way is exactly the opposite of what we were taught to do. We're distracting, we're disconnecting, we're, we're deprived, we're fixing, we're escaping, we're blaming, or we're taking the blame. That's why this is a two to five year project, really, in most families. So, I mean, for the profound shift. Stephanie Brown writes about that in The Alcoholic Family and Recovery. So that's very much tied to I should have, never should have, uh, I can't stand her discomfort, that would be the the, 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 the mascara and the cigarette lighter and the girl throwing up in the next room. My love will fix this. These are some lesser lies, but the top three are, if only I'm keeping her alive and I owe. And psychodrama works very well for the I owe person too, who's carrying this belief that they owe. And a bad thing happened or lots of bad things happen. Okay. We've got just enough time to do this exercise. I hope you'll find it fun. Now you get to do a little bit of interactive 
fun stuff. I hope you'll like it. So the question I'm posing to you is how do I define my practice? And by practice, I mean you know, the way I care for myself, the way I develop and sustain my ground of being. Okay? It's also, obviously, uh, another way uh, it connotes my therapy practice. So before you do this, let's just, let me give you the instructions. I want you to form into little groups, and it'd be nice if you moved around. If you do this with people you know best, it's not as good. Seriously. Bust a move, go over and sit with somebody else, especially you, Hunter. Form into little groups or triads. And if the people near you don't know, that's fine, but if you're sitting with all your buds, shake it up a little bit. Very briefly, really less than two minutes total for your group, tell them something about your current spiritual orientation or your practice, your personal practice for self-care. Focus on your sources of meaning and connection. What helps you keep coming back? And if your story is, you know, I'm at the end of my rope, I can barely stand it anymore, great, you're, you're gonna fit right in. If, on the other hand, you, you gave that lecture at the Zen monastery the next day, I'm glad you're here too. So we're all somewhere in between or at the extreme. And if, you have, if it comes to you listening to others or you already know, tell your group a little bit about some spiritual aspect of your practice that you would like to develop. Like me personally, I need to spend more time quiet. I know I do. Just, just do. Okay? So here's a little imagery to guide you in just forming up and quick intros. Do it. Come on. Have a little fun. You got the rest of this conference to sit and listen to people. Mrs. Perlmutter will be bringing you a handout. Good. Yeah, I can hand them out, sweetheart. You need one of these handouts in each group? These are going to guide you. Don't be shy. Yeah, a four-pack is cool. You guys are a four foursome. Everyone doesn't have to have one. You don't need everybody to have one. You just need one. Or... It's, you'll pass it around. You'll see. Here, good. Here. Deprived lady. Okay. And if Brenda gives you the laryngitis story, don't go for it. <laughs> she, she does that in all these workshops. Well, wait, let me tell you how to start. Well, I'm sorry, I did tell you how to start. The introductions, yes. You're just introducing yourselves and saying a little bit about your work and how you take care of yourself. Don't use the handout yet. Yeah. Don't use the handout yet, just intros.
All right, are we close enough? Do you get each person a chance to? Okay. Whoever's talking right now, three more words and move on to the next person. <laughs> you got, yeah, I got the pros over here. You guys got to did you just tell each other one thing so far, pretty much there? All right, let me ask you to pause for a second. Everybody, give me your attention. Here's what we're going to do now. So you got to know a little bit about some aspect of the spiritual practice of... Hello. It's, I know. This is nice, right? Well, just one group in the back. Help me out. We're moving on. Hi. Thank you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I want you to imagine that each of your little clusters is composed of family members and a therapist, okay? So choose someone. You can do all this at once. I'm going to give you the instructions, then you do the whole thing. Somebody volunteer to be the therapist, and have it be somebody that normally wouldn't do it, all right? So you shy person, dare to, dare to do it, if you would, if it's okay. The other, the other ones of you, just look around at each other and just kind of raise your hand and say who you are in the family. Pretend you're related. So let's say it's these four people and you're the therapist, right? Let's just say. Let's just say. So you could just go, I'm the, I'm the son, I'm the mom, I'm the dad. Just each person just volunteer for a role. Gender matches helps or apparent gender matches helps. I taught at SF State in human sexuality, so we say apparent gender matches. Okay? So you don't need a story, you don't need a backstory, just, you know, I'm the son, I'm the dad, I'm the mom, I'm the grandma, whatever you want to be, okay? Then you therapist, take a look at the list of questions. You're going to need to take a minute and pick one or two that stimulate you. Not that you think you would do a good job asking. That might be tied to difficult areas from your own family life. Okay? And get into this family that's being made up around you, and then you guys in the family, like, you're just going to make it up. So let's say you ask, tell me a little something about privacy in the family when you guys grew up. Then just work from your own mind. There's no, you don't need to, there's no getting it right. You know what I'm saying? Just respond the way it seems like you'd respond, knowing that whoever else is sitting there, like your mom and dad are sitting there, or your wife and son are sitting there, okay? It's a little forced, but if, if you get it, it, it's cool. Did you, did you just come back? Do you need a group? Because there's a small group. Yeah, be a, be a trio. She will not be the therapist. Okay? Okay. All right? Any questions? When you're in your therapist role, Kind of try to pay attention to your breathing and what you just notice about your body. And when you're a family member, see what you notice about the therapist and how he or she seems affected. They're already going. Go. Discuss among yourselves.
sorry. If you move through that kind of quick, you can rotate and do a whole other scenario with someone else as the therapist, start over, create a new family, if you want. We'll just do one more if you want. Yeah, it's start all over, new therapist, new family. Okay, how about one more minute? One minute? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's let's end here. Wrap. End your conversation. <laughs> Stay with your group. Stay with your group. Come back to me, please. Hi. Okay. Good. Stay with your group. Come back to me. I don't want to whistle, because we're getting to the soft part. Let me ask, um, any observations? What did, what did people notice during this? A lot of laughter, which is nice. Let's just bring it down. I want to get quiet for a minute. 
Any observations? Anybody just what you noticed, what you were aware of? Just anything? Felt seemed awkward, a little bit forced. Okay. You guys found yourself in roles and sort of fit right in? Sorry? I have the best group in the room. <laughs> Other observations? Uh huh. Dad and teenager. Dad and teen. Uh, the person in the therapist role said it felt very familiar to me. I had a dad and a teenage daughter, and I have actually worked with such a pairing, and so it felt very familiar. Our therapist interrupted our little lies that we were caught up in. Can you hear him? Felt kind of anxiety provoking. I was really connecting to some of the responses. What role were you in, sir? Family member? Family member. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Did I see a hand in the back there? Yes. Are able to sit in the kind of wounded or painful. Hmm. Thank you. Could you people hear that? Kenneth's brilliant foundation made it possible for me. <laughs> Here's what I'd like us to take a minute and consider. If you had any experience of a connection to or a resonance with a kind of wounded, traumatized, or hurt energy in yourself or anyone else in your group. I want us to try to move toward that with the idea in mind that in every you know, precious being that we're given the privilege to know, particularly in our roles as therapists, that that wounded spot that toxic spot sits right inside of the most precious, sacred, and special aspects of that person. And we can't separate them. We want to sit with them and live, help the person live in harmony with their fundamental goodness and their sense of personal defectiveness or woundedness. And that's the precious moment that we're given. That's the sacred trust we're permitted to experience. And you can do this driving the van for the treatment center right? if you're paying attention. And that's the challenge for us. You know, you can have I had an office at a treatment center in Sausalito, a $35 million property with a view of San Francisco Bay and 600 thread count sheets. And what I wanted to pay attention to was that precious space in between the wound and the goodness, where those two meet, is that sacred moment of connection. How can I show up for that? How can I look for that? Is what I'm asking myself. How can I attend to that? And my best answer is like with where we started in those early slides. Like is to have a sacred practice that brings me closer to that. And be able to tolerate the truth about me. My own defectiveness, my own fallibility. The covert messages that filled me up from childhood and the lies that bind me to the rigid and stuck ways of being. 
you know, how are you now choosing to define your ground of being? What do you gonna sh- what are you going to show up for at work? You know? What is a truly sustainable posture? Because I find that when it's on, when I'm trying to attend to that precious connection, moment, space, interaction, interstice, if you want a nice little word. When I'm attending to that, I can go a long time. I can come back tomorrow and I can, you know, I've got to go home too and walk my dog. In other words, I can't get obsessed. I've got to have balance. So I hope you'd leave today wondering, what do I want to enhance about my own spiritual practice? How do I manage that primary wound that derives from disconnection, from fundamental goodness? What are the forces that interrupt me, and how do they manifest in my clients? Because this is how we make this work meaningful. And I like how we could get quiet and just sit and contemplate that sweetness, you know, and this privilege. When I look at it that way, it's pretty exciting and real. And I'll close with this because the word real reminds me. The moms will come to treatment and they'll tell their kids, I just want you to be happy. I just want them to be happy. And I tell the moms, you can't, how do you give somebody happy? You can't make somebody happy. And when the moms leave, I say to the kids, I, don't, I can't make you happy. You know what I want? I want you to be real. That's what I want. I want you to be real. And when I look them in the eye and say that, they feel it. We all feel it in the room. But I have to be real for that to have meaning. So that brings me back to how do I show up? How do I express my truth? And then the hard one, how do I ask for help? And that's where I'd like to leave it. I just want you to be real. We got time for a final comment or a question if anybody has to? Should we just leave it here? Yeah? Make sense in a way? Namaste.